Beautiful. Thank you very much for encouraging us with that. All right. Are we setting up the PowerPoint? Great. Uh, so anyway, uh, last Sunday we finished our series on Hebrews. We didn't do much in Hebrews 13, all right, but I'm going to leave that for you all to study. Uh, here's the group from Friday night, teens in campus. We did flight, fit, and fun, something like that. And uh, I, I was there, and the second, young, old, the second oldest person there was Louie at like 31, and then there was me at 64. So all, all the people are looking at me, the workers are like, who's this guy? <laughs> but, you know what, I beat Louie on, the, on the, the obstacle course there, so there we go. And should have seen Vlad running up the, what, I don't know, those things there? It's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is, real crazy stuff. And then we had our singles go to Tehachapi. And Paul was uh, kind of introducing us to his hometown there. It was really great. And just, you know, we're having a devotional once a month. And then we're having social activities kind of, you know, in between those. And I, we're starting to have fun as a singles group. And we're getting spiritual all at the same time. So that's really great stuff. Now, I just, you know, I'm, on Thursday of this week, I'm heading to Poland be teaching for our church in Warsaw, and from there I'm going to be going to Copenhagen, and then Oslo, visiting our churches in the Baltics, uh, I'm sorry, in the Nordic region, and then from there I'm going to uh, Tallinn and Estonia, and then going to be visiting Riga and Latvia, and so uh, be praying for me, it's going to be a lot of energy. And that, now next Sunday, Josh is going to preach his first sermon. All right. So we should see a huge turnout on our campus group. They better show up. Yeah. All right. Uh, so that's going to be great. And then the next Sunday, we're going to have Amir Burton down from Antelope Valley. And the Sunday after that, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to be gone for like 17 days. But unfortunately, that's three Sundays. And so, uh, Gary Simmons, who leads the group up in Fresno. So, it's going to be having some great preaching, a lot of encouragement. And the, the thing I'm most sad about is I'm going to miss Rush Week at the campus. So, uh, we're going to be having activities. We have, uh, we're, we have this awesome flyer. We're going to have activities practically every day for like a month and a half. And we invite you, if you can, to come up, even if it's just for a couple hours, not next week, but the week after. So we'll learn more about that next Sunday to come up on campus and share with some students. I mean, I share with them, and they come, and I'm, I, I'm just about the oldest person in this room. So if I can do it, you could do it too, right? Amen. All right, so anyway, that's that. Now, um, I want to talk about the sermon we're doing today. It's Thoughts on the Book of Acts and Church History. I did a, a lesson, a little bit of a lesson from Acts 20 uh, a couple months ago. So I'm going to go back to Acts chapter 1. So turn with me there. Now, it's possible to think of the book of Acts as just this happened, and then, and then there's this other thing over here, and there's this little of other thing over here. But the book of Acts is a story. And you have to understand, it's Luke and Acts, right? Luke and Acts. That's one story. And uh, probably the reason they're divided is because uh, it was too long to fit on a scroll. Did you know that Luke mo wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else? Did you know that? In fact, he's a Gentile, so it's kind of interesting. A Gentile, yes, there's more material from Luke than there is from Paul. You can add the pages, it's true. And so the story of Luke is Jesus going to Jerusalem. That's the theme throughout. It, you, you, it's this picture of him going to Jerusalem and arriving at Jerusalem and then dying in Jerusalem and being raised. And the story of Acts is Jesus leaving Jerusalem, going all over the world through the Holy Spirit. Because like we said when we did our lesson on the Holy Spirit, you could call the book of Acts the, the, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. All right, and so 
The book of Acts then is the story of how Jesus' name was spread, beginning in Jerusalem, to the whole known world at that time. So let's read in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Actually, I'll go back to verse 7. So this is Jesus' final words to the disciples. I want you to get a picture. We're in an upper room, somewhere between 100 and 120 followers of Jesus. And these are his, this is his final charge and his vision that he gave to them. He said to them, It is not for you to know the time or the days the Father set for, uh, by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now let's, let's get the picture here. What you have is a bunch of hillbillies. Sorry about people from southeastern Ohio, uh, West Virginia, and, you know. But, you know, these were Galileans. And the Galileans, they were, you know, kind of the country people. They didn't have much power. This group, they had virtually no money. They had no political connections to speak of. Very little education. And again, they were the country bumpkins, if I can say that without being mean. And Jesus said to them, you're going to bring my word to all Jerusalem. And I imagine them looking around going, all Jerusalem? You're kidding. And then he said, to Judea and Samaria. And they're thinking, we hate the Samaritans. And they hate us. And they're looking around, who's he talking about? And then what did he say next? To the whole world. And we're talking about the Greek world and the Roman world. Not only do these people have no money, very little education, no political connections, no power. They were from the smallest province, the least important province in Rome. They didn't speak Latin. They didn't speak Greek. Their culture, their culture was radically different. And Jesus says, yes, you're going to take it to the whole world. And the book of Acts is the story of them actually doing it. it. It actually happened. They changed the world. The world has never been the same. Now, I'm going to argue that we probably have more money, more talent, more political connection in this room than they had in that room that night. I believe God could use the people in this room to change literally the entire world. Do you believe that? I mean, you're supposed to say yes, but imagine you were in that room. And I imagine, and they're like, you're kidding. <laughs> you know, who's he talking about? Us? So I want to talk about the factors that led to their being able to put this vision into, pra into practice. And I want us to have a vision of what this group of people with God and with the Holy Spirit, what we could actually do. I believe that what they did, we could do. But you know what? We got a lot of friends to help us out. You know, there's a few other people kind of in our fellowship that aren't sitting in this room right now. So how did they do it? And how could we do it? I, I want us to have a sense of vision of what God could do through us. And I'm talking about us as in the ragtag group of people sitting in this room. Kind of a ragtag group, right? All right. Let, let's just be honest about it. All right. But I, I, I believe we have as much talent and money. So five points. And this, this is my sermon. This sermon has five points, all right? Number one, it's because they knew Jesus. And there's just something about a person who's had a personal encounter with Jesus. Uh, number two, uh, they had some facts, like the empty tomb, to kind of help them out. That was kind of convenient, having that empty tomb there. And I believe these are the things that launched the church. Having Jesus people, number one, and having the evidence. 
And this is what launched the church. But I'm telling you, what's interesting is, as, as the church spread more than, say, 50, 100 miles away, and as less and less proportion were actual eyewitnesses, then the, the relative importance of these became less in some sense, and yet the church spread even faster. And I, so I want to mention three other factors, if you will. Number one, it was the moral and ethical superiority of the, of the Christians. There was something about their lifestyle. It was radically different. And people were drawn into the church. Number four, they won the battle at the universities. The church was able to answer the questions that the Greek philosophers could not. And I'm telling you, this is a historical fact. I'm going to fill in a few details. It's a historical fact that after a while, the Stoics, the Epicureans, they really had nothing to say. And so they won the battles even on the intellectual level. And number five, the Christians gave dignity to the people that the Greeks and Romans considered unimportant. Slaves were equal to their masters. And women were given equal respect to men, which was a total revolution. Oh, and point number six, because God was with them. You know what I'm saying? I think that's pretty important as well. So that's the outline here. So let's, let's, let's uh, go through that. So point number one, point number one, It's, there's just something about a person who's met Jesus. Let's go to Acts 4, verse 12 and 13. Folks, I'm telling you, there's just something about a person who has met Jesus. A person who has met Jesus, they're different. I mean, they're seriously different. thing is, in the first century, everybody knew it. When the Christians showed up in your town, your town was never the same again. Acts 4, 12 and 13. Now, you've got, you got to remember who's talking here. Peter, James, John, who had fled in fear, in hiding. They're in this upper room because they're, they're scared to death. And this, this, they're, now they're speaking before the leaders of the Jewish people. They say, salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that they'd been with Jesus. You know, there's just something about a person who's been with Jesus. You know, the, the Jews and later the Romans, they tried to wipe this group out. But none of their methods worked. There's many stories. What they would do is they would arrest the leaders. Generally, in the first 100, 150 years, the greatest persecutions actually came in the 3rd and 4th century. So what they would do is they, they'd figure, let's wipe out the church in Alexandria. So they'd arrest all the leaders, and they'd threaten everybody else, assuming that obviously if you arrest, arrest the leaders, everybody else would scatter. But what would happen is hundreds of disciples from all over would flock to that city in the hopes that they could be arrested as well for the name of Jesus. This is what happened. There's plenty of stories of this. Because there's just something about a person who's had a personal encounter with Jesus. Think about Paul. Paul had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And I'm telling you, Paul was never the same again. If you want to start a revolution here in Bakersfield and in this valley, point number one is we need to have Jesus people here. We need to have people who've had a personal encounter with Jesus. Because if you know Jesus, if you really, really know Jesus, you'll be bold. And it's going to be scary. 
and these leaders there in Acts 4, they, they, they just couldn't figure it out. Who are these people? Fearless. Because they met Jesus. And Jesus is not like any other person who ever lived. Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus. So if you met Jesus on, I don't know, Old River Road or whatever the equivalent would be, I, I don't really know. Because I'm telling you, if you have a personal encounter, if you really get Jesus, you will live a fearless life. And like I said, everywhere these Jesus people went, they turned the world upside down, right? We, we know that, right? There, there's that play, but that's, that's taken right out of Acts chapter 17. All right, point number two is powerful truth claims. Let's go to Acts 2, 22 through 24. So point number one, if we're going to start a revolution here, if we're going to make Bakersfield never be the same again, which I believe can be done, if they could do it, surely we could. We're just talking about Jerusalem, right? We're not talking about Judea and Samaria yet. We're just talking about Jerusalem. Then we need to have people who know Jesus. Point number two, they had some pretty awesome truth claims to kind of fall back on. Verse 22, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So Peter gets up in front of thousands of people, and he says, Jesus, who works signs, wonders, and miracles, as everybody knows. And people then go, really? I've never heard about that. Jesus? Who's he? And Really? He works some miracles? Uh, no, i would never heard about that. It wasn't that way. I mean, everybody knew it. And, you know, when they decided to kill Jesus after he raised Lazarus from the dead... They didn't decide to kill him because they didn't believe he raised him. They decided to kill him because they did believe he raised him from the dead. The person that we worship, he walked on water. He turned water to wine. He raised Jairus' daughter, healed her. In fact, he was raised from the dead on the third day. That empty tomb. And so people would try to intimidate the church, and they say, hey, have you paid a visit to the tomb where they put Jesus' body? Have you, have, you, have, you, have you been over there? Did you hear about that empty tomb? I don't know, something about the fact that their leader had been raised from the dead. I think that partially explains why the church grew. You know, we, we have the messianic prophecies. It, it, one thing is, if you look at the early sermons, every sermon except the one in Acts 17, uh, the preacher talks about the fact that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Messiah. They talk about the fact that Jesus worked amazing and incredible signs, wonders, and miracles like nobody ever before. And they talked about the fact that he was killed and he was raised from the dead. And that kind of got people's attention. What do you think? Yeah, the, 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 the person that we worship, according to the Old Testament, had to be born in Bethlehem. So where was Jesus born? Bethlehem, that's Micah uh, 6. He had to be raised in Galilee near Nazareth, all right? That's Isaiah 9. So where, where was Jesus raised? Somewhere in you know, the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, he had to be despised and rejected, check mark. Had to be meek and silent before his hearers, Isaiah 53, check mark. Had to be pierced, Isaiah 53, check mark. Had to be crucified, Psalm 22, check mark. Had to have his garments divided and gambled over, uh, uh, Psalm 22, check mark. Uh, had to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, uh, um, 
Zechariah 11, 17, checkmark, had to come to Jerusalem and make atonement for sin in roughly 30 AD, Daniel chapter 9, 24 and 25, checkmark. Uh, you know what? I think Jesus is actually the Messiah. You know what? One of the things we have going for us here in this church is we're, ha we're right. You know? The thing we believe, it's true. Jesus is the one. He is the son of God. I don't know. That's a pretty good reason for people to believe in him. And so these two things launch the church against all odds. Because remember, these were unschooled, ordinary people. And some of us are schooled, extraordinary people. A few of us are. And those of us who are unschooled and ordinary, well, we're just like those guys, and that's all they had. So that's, I believe, what started the church. But you know what? In the second generation, in the third generation, when they're over there in, say, Corinth, or maybe they're somewhere in Italy or northern Africa, you know, 800, 1,000, 1,500 miles away, and actually most of the actual eyewitnesses are dead at this point, I, I would say to some extent the uh, uh, initial impulse that came from the facts was probably slightly less in some ways. You know, it was like, yeah, the, those people 30 years ago or 50 years ago, and yet the church grew even more. That's the amazing thing. All right? And so point number three, because those who worship Jesus, they're just different. They're, they're just different. Acts 17, 5 through 9. Acts 17, verses 5 through 9. But other Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters. I don't think I'd want to be in that crowd. A bad character. You know, there's a lot of bad characters out there, aren't there? And those bad characters, by the way, they're not going to come into the kingdom. All right? They're not. But there's a lot of people out there that are looking. There's a lot of people out there that are looking for something different. They're looking for somebody who's going to stand up for something. They're looking for somebody who's going to stand for the truth, who's going to have strong moral and ethical standards. Now, if you act that way, the majority of people are going to laugh at you and they're going to scoff. Maybe those who are open, maybe it's only 10 or 15%. But what's 10 or 15 percent of 500,000 people? Are five percent? What's five percent of 500,000 people? That's 25,000 people. That's how many people out there that are looking for somebody who's living a different life. Oh, I forgot. I'm supposed to read the scripture. Okay. Where are we reading? Acts 17. All right. So, but other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason out and some other, official, uh, other believers before the city officials shouting, These men have caused trouble all over the world, have come here. How awesome is that? They caused trouble all over the world. Remember Jesus' vision? Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. How do you think they felt about it? It's like, it's, it's happening. And you know, they made trouble. When the Christians came into Ephesus, the sale of idols went way down. And they burned their books of sorcery, right? And that got people mad. When you walk into a company 
suddenly the corrupt, the corrupt people are going to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Because when corruption happens at the company, you look people in the eye and you say, wait a minute, we can't do that sort of thing. Now, if you do that, are people going to be happy about that? No, but some will. Because there's people in that company that are looking for that. And that's what the early church was like. They caused trouble all over the world. My question is, where are you causing trouble? Now, if you cause trouble by being obnoxious or rude, you don't get any points for that, right? That's in Peter, right? If you suffer persecution for being, you know, a bad person, (laughs) no check marks for that. But I'm telling you, the church... They made a stir. They really did. They refused to take part in the entertainment of the world. Uh, In in Acts uh, 19, let me see here. Uh, Yeah, there's that little riot, right? Long live Artemis of the Ephesians. Long live Artemis of the Ephesians. I've been there. I, I, I took that picture. That's where it happened. Brothers and sisters, we need to be willing to shake some things up. I remember one time I was in a, it was in a, 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 like a Kinko's or whatever, and the guy next to me, he was making copies. They, they, were, put, they were putting for their frat, they are going to put on the movie Deep Throat. Now, if you know what that movie is, let's not talk about it. Okay. And I said, oh, so you're going to put on that movie? He said, yeah. I said, you should be ashamed of yourself. That is disgusting. Is that the way you view women? Is that, is that the image you want to put out there? of how you, as a group of people, view women? What's wrong with you? Now, how do you think that guy reacted? (laughs) But I'm telling you, we need to call things what they are. Not arrogantly, humbly. Uh, But I'm telling you, in, in the in the first, second, and third century, the people knew about the Christians. You know, the Greeks had this concept. Let me see. I can't remember if it's in the slide or not. All right. Yes. Okay. It's not. The Greeks had this idea of what the ideal person was. They had their seven virtues. And I'm telling you, if you saw the seven virtues that that the Greeks put out there, they'd sound pretty Christian, actually. All right. Uh, humility wasn't one of them, but all the others would be pretty good Christian virtues. But you know, th- their idea was the only way somebody could actually live like that was to devote their whole life to being that way, to become a philosopher and spend their whole life studying and, and devoting that and, and, and removing themselves from the world. Then they had these Christians who lived that way, and they couldn't figure it out. There's a guy, Galen. Galen is uh, the, the Latin equivalent of Hippocrates, you know, the, the great physician in Roman Greece. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, the Roman philosopher Galen pointed out this striking feature of the Christian church. He said, their teaching, now this is a pagan who does not have any interest in being a Christian, said their teaching of rewards and punishment in a future life led to a lifestyle not inferior to that of the genuine philosophers. They had these people living among them that were living lives that, like, because I think even, even the total pagans know what a good life looks like. They know what a good life looks like, and that's supposed to be us. They live lives not so inferior to that of the genuine philosophy to Galen. This fact was especially notable in the disciples' restraint in cohabitation. Can we have an amen for that one? Is that... A highly accepted philosophy? Restraint from cohabitation? I mean, we believe in purity before marriage. You know what? I think in their heart of hearts, a lot of people wish they could do it, but none of them do. All right, let me see. Uh, Their self-control in matters of food and drink. Well, I'm going to work on that a little bit. All right, keen pursuit of social justice. They knew it. The church cared about people and their contempt of death. Notice that. He said, these Christians have an absolute contempt of death. 
You couldn't intimidate them. And that's their idea of the ideal philosopher. You know, we have a constitution. Now there's the one that, you know, there's, there's the political one, but we have the, you know, the Sermon on the Mount. You know what I'm saying? We say the way to greatness is humility. We say the way to riches is poverty. We actually say it and we actually act that way. All right? And so I believe that point number three of why the church grew in revolutionized and changed the world is because the bottom line is they were different. They lived a lifestyle that those out there wished they could live, but they'd given up on it. And so I think we need to be that kind of people. Point number four. All right, they won the battle at the university. Let's go to Acts 17. Actually, we're there, aren't we? Acts 17. You know, <laughs> in Acts 17, let's, let's read a couple of verses, and then I'll kind of explain what's going on here. Let me see, in verse 16, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. So what happened is they invited him out, all right, to the Areopagus. The Areopagus uh, that's right below the, the Acre Corinth, you know, where the big temples are in, in, in Athens there. So that's, there, there was this big temple there. That's just a bunch of rocks now. But anyway, I think I got to take that picture. Anyway, whatever. So here's where, is where all the philosophers and the smart people gathered. And they brought in this Paul, and they're thinking, this guy is going to make a fool of himself. This Jewish guy who has no training in Stoicism and Epicureanism and Pythagoreanism. Ah, let's let, listen to this guy. We're going to have a really great laugh. And Paul got up there, and I'm telling you, what happened over the next two or three centuries is, eventually, all these schools of Stoics and, and Epicureans, they started closing, because the bottom line is, Christianity offers the answers to the questions people really care about. And, you know, uh, Paul gave a presentation here. He reasoned with them. He confronted the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophy. And he expounded Christian philosophy. Because uh, the Epicureans and the Stoics, they, they're kind of different. The Stoics had this idea of of God being distant and unknowable. And the Epicureans kind of pan, pantheists, the idea that sort of that God is not even a person and he's unknowable and he's distant and God could, you know, would never relate to us in any way whatsoever. So he presents a better idea of God. Let's read about that, starting in verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting in the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and I looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. By the way, in this little section of his sermon, the Epicureans and the Stoics are like, yeah, they're totally with Paul on this. It's ridiculous. All these idols, they didn't, they didn't into that stuff at all. You know what Paul did? He found common ground. He found common ground with the Sikh that you meet on campus, or with the Buddhist, or the Hindu, or the whatever flavor of interesting Christianity, or the, the nun, you know, the, the nuns, that's not N-U-N-S, that's N-O-N-E-S, that's the main thing we see on campus, right? And he, he, he had a conversation with them, he says, the thing that you believe in, I want to show you something better, and so here's what he showed him. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. They're with him on that totally. They're, they're totally with him on that. It says, it is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, but rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. 
From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of the lands. He did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him. Though he's not far from any of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As one of your poets has said, we are his offspring. And he talks about how God is near, that God wants a relationship with us. He's not some distant, unknowable God. Another thing is, Paul could quote their philosophers. Paul knew Buddhism better than the Buddhist. He knew Islam better than the Muslim. He knew Hinduism better than the average Hindu. He understood postmodernism better than the postmodern. And I'm telling you, by the second and third century, the, these schools of philosophy were closing. Because the bottom line is, we have the answers. The answers to the important questions. Why am I here? What is my purpose? What is my place? What is the right thing to do? So point number, is it four? I can't remember. Point number four is they won the battles at the university. and We t need to not be intimidated. When we get up there on campus, I, I think a lot of Christians like, oh, I hope don't, they don't ask me too many questions. And, you know, people say, oh, Christianity is stupid. How can we believe in it? We kind of like, oh, well, okay, you know. And, Wimpy! I don't know, we need to be more bold, I think. So he won the battle at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. There at the lecture hall of Tyrannus, he, if you read in Acts uh, not, uh, 19, he started a campus ministry, and through that campus ministry, the entire province of Asia heard the word. Through that campus ministry, the entire province of Asia heard the word because they were Jesus' people. Because they had some facts like the empty tomb. And they live exemplary lives. And the bottom line is they offered the answers that the philosophers and the other religious people couldn't do. So there you go. The lecture hall of Fresno State or, I, sorry, I forgot to get my Cal State Bakersfield logo there. All right, great. I'm going to skip a bunch of things about worldview and Paul confronting those worldviews. That's really great stuff. I don't have time for that. Naturalism and materialism and all that stuff and postmodernism. All right, and all the, I'm going to skip all that. That's great stuff, but I don't have time for that. Okay, great. The bottom line is uh, we have the answers that people need. Okay, point number five. I'm, I'm, I'm getting down to it. I, I'm still good. Yep, point number five. Great. All right, uh, point number five is that the church meets needs. The church gave respect to the people that other people didn't respect. Acts 2, 44 through 45. Acts 2, verses 44 and 45. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And see, in the Greek and Roman society, a slave was nothing. And women were expected to be quiet and to stay at home. It was a very aristocratic society. And if you weren't Greek or Roman, you were... Nothing. You weren't important. Acts 3, 6 through 10. Peter and John said, silver and gold, I don't have a whole lot of that. But what we have, we give you. And I'm telling you, the church met needs, and everybody knew it. There's the story of plague in Alexandria. There was plague in Alexandria. This is in the late second century, and what the pagans would do is when their family members got the plague, they would literally put them out in the street out of fear. So what the Christians did is they would, they, they would get carts. They would go all around the city picking up those people and taking them to their church buildings and, try, and trying to meet their needs and, and, and helping them. And many of the Christians died because they got the plague. 
But you know what? The church grew, and the people in Alexandria never forgot who really cared about them. Jeremiah 22, 15, and 16. Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar? Did not your father have food and drink? He did what was right and just, so all went well with him. He defended the cause of the poor and the needy, so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord. And, you know, we need to be a church where everybody realizes we care. The people who are homeless. Thank you for reaching out to that homeless friend. Maybe not the wisest thing, but I appreciate your heart about reaching out to that homeless lady. That's great. You know, we care about the immigrants. Yes, we love the illegal immigrants. Absolutely. We want to minister to them. Now, maybe they possibly need to, I don't know, maybe they need to, I, I don't know about the politics there. That's, that's a whole other deal. But we love them. That's our job. And, and whoever is disenfranchised and not cared for by the society, our response is Compassion. You know, Julian the Apostate, I might have this as a slide, I can't remember. All right, uh, yes. So you, this guy, by the way, is the son of Constantine. You probably heard of Constantine. Constantine was the one who basically made Christianity legal. Well, his son was not a big, you know, fan of that. His son was trying to return Rome to paganism. But he knew uh, some of the most important Christians of his day. And so... In this little quote from, from Julian, uh, the atheism, he's talking about Christians. That they, but by the way, they called us atheists. The reason they called us atheists is because we only believed in one God instead of all the other gods. They say, well, that's the same as believing in none at all. Right? You don't believe in any of our gods. So he says, Christianity has been especially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal. There's, there's not a single Christian, read that Christian, who is a beggar, and that the godless Christians care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. And I'm telling you, the slaves poured into the church. Women poured into the church. Foreigners poured into the church. But I'm telling you, even amongst those prideful, rich aristocrats, there's a few honest souls. So even from Caesar's household, all right? Because I'm telling you, those people, there's, there's some out there that are looking for the truth. And the church didn't just convert poor people and slaves. It converted every kind of person. Let's finish in Acts 5, 38 and 39. Now, what I want us to take from this sermon is a vision for what God could do. Now, I look around and I kind of go, you know, like I said, ragtag group. It's true. You know? But I see probably as much education, talent, money, and connection as the group in the room in Acts Chapter 1, all right? And the thing is, it actually happened. All right, Acts 5, this is, uh, this is Gamaliel talking, right? Acts 5, 30 and 39. It's kind of interesting what he said. Sometimes God's enemies said pretty cool stuff. You know, like they said, let his blood be on us and our children. You know, it's necessary for one to die so a whole nation could be saved. All that really great stuff they said. Not realizing what they were saying there. It's kind of cool. So Acts 5, 39. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, listen to these men. Let, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting God. Jesus said to them, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and you're going to take my word to all Jerusalem. And Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. They had the wrong language, they had the wrong culture, they had the wrong background. They were from an insignificant province in an insignificant state, and yet they did it. Why? 
Because there's just something about a Jesus person. There's just something about a person who's had a personal encounter with this most amazing man who ever lived. Just like Paul who met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Another reason is because, you know, the empty tomb. It, the, it just so happens the one we believe in is the one. And they knew it. And they were fearless. And also because they lived lives that were exemplary. That even their enemies would go, wow, these people live amazing lives. A lot of them didn't like it, but a few of them did. And they won the battle at the university. And because they had compassion on those, the world didn't have compassion. And by the way, because God was with them. Uh, thank you very much.